Greetings. Welcome to the second part of our event. I uh, I can see here that um, maybe the lunch did not agree with some of the participants in the first panel. Um, now we're going to have the second part, which is going to be more positive. In the first part, we spoke about whether we do need a new nuclear power. But now we're going to be talking about some more positive things, such as opportunities for development, uh, uh, the green transition is an opportunity, not as an obstacle. And this um, uh, we've been doing in Zazemiata uh, Greenpeace for years. Uh, unfortunately, um, we, I mean, there isn't much um, there in terms of uh, politicians helping us. They are uh, agreeing with the uh, unions uh, and um, you know, these agreements that they are saying are basically unfeasible, how coal is going to be long-lived and there will be base power such as new nuclear power plant instead of looking at the new opportunities which uh, exist, uh, such as uh, decentralization of the uh, power generation, improving energy efficiency and access of uh, uh, different households to renewable energy sources, possibilities for... Uh, uh, energy cooperatives, which Associate Professor Zinoviev will share with us a bit later, and that's why we were discussing this. Uh, these are measures that are very accessible, uh, that uh, contravene the traditional energy projects that we're constantly discussing, and uh, we hear advertising and advertising campaigns from politicians and media. The politicians have withdrawn. Uh, ever since I invited them to the event, they've been doing only one thing. They're resigning. I hope some of them at least are um, listening. Uh, I think some of them registered to listen to us on Zoom. But now, uh, let's not waste any more time and start with uh, Radostina Radi from uh, Zazimiata, who has been working on this topic for years. Uh, Radi, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Todor. Uh, I am so happy to see this uh, uh, high level of interest towards this, uh, today's uh, hybrid discussion. I am here today as the coordinator of energy and climate in the Zazimiata team and also a national uh, coordinator for the uh, Together for 1.5 uh, project, uh, which is uh, led by Climate uh, Network Action Europe. Who, of which we are a proud members. Today, we are going to present you the outcomes of some of the latest reports of uh, CAN Europe, which uh, views the benefits of uh, the intensified uh, climate actions, such as, um, for example, opening with uh, a few introductory words about the report. I'm going to talk a little bit about the methodology that's being used to perform the calculations. I'm going to share conclusions on both the level of the EU and the Bulgaria in terms of um, sharing the numbers. Uh, these will be two main directions, adjacent or additional uh, benefits uh, from uh, the methods to uh, fight climate change and the climate losses, which could be prevented if we act fast and adopt these ambitious climate uh, mitigation or uh, climate measures. Uh, so uh, several words about the report. The report was published in the middle of January in English. Uh, the links uh, is accessible. You can uh, see it as an original and the translation into English by us. Uh, uh, a shorter version of the report, uh, the outcomes and the conclusions of the European Union uh, um, methodology used. Um, and because I believe, even though I believe that most of you are already aware of the Paris Climate Agreement, uh, and we're on the same page there, just let me uh, showcase you what is the goal of 1.5 degrees. Uh, uh, it's the, basically the heart of the report that we're, the core of the report that we're discussing today. So the initial uh, idea was to limit the uh, global warming up to two degrees, but over time, more and more scientific data started appearing that the damage, um, both for ecosystems and the economies and the public uh, would be much uh, um, 
bigger if we were to follow this two degrees goal compared to the more ambitious goal of 1.5. And that is why right now the goal is to not allow a warming exceeding uh, 1.5 degrees, which you can see on the slide in the orange line. The uh, report methodology, the foundation of it is the scenario of Can Europe, uh, which was developed uh, together with other partners such as the EEP, the Environment Europe and Environmental Bureau. Uh, the full name is the Paris Agreement Compatible Scenario or the uh, Roadmap of Transformation of the European Economy making it compliant with the Paris Agreement goal. The purpose is uh, um, basically having some important assumptions in the scenario, which underlies uh, GHG cuts in EU more than 65%, which is above the current goal of 55% uh, net uh, decrease. Uh, decrease of uh, GHG emissions. Uh, so the current goal of the EU is not enough to reach the Paris Climate Agreement goals. However, climate science says that 65% is the required decline. And so the larger goal of the European Union is to um, uh, for the EU to become the first climate neutral continent, which can happen in, uh, earlier about 2040. In combination with the PAC scenario as part of the report, we have uh, underlying data from two uh, modeling, some European projects, so Horizon 2020. These are the COMBI projects, which uh, values um, um, the benefits of some uh, ambitious actions on energy efficiency, which basically means achieving a high level of energy savings, which are compatible with the business as usual. Uh, and the model and the project coach, which uh, creates value for or uh, evaluates uh, um, damage caused by climate change. When we did the literature review in the start, uh, at the time that we started uh, writing the report, uh, we did two main uh, directions of calculations of uh, climate uh, Benefits. We're talking about two main di dimensions. On the one hand, the um, additional benefits or the uh, benefits that um, come as a result of uh, climate mitigation measures and also uh, avoided losses or avoided impacts, which could be avoided. Uh, let's start with the uh, losses. To get to the oh, one of the main news items in our report, so the quality of loss that could be avoided, we uh, create a comparison between the so called ambitious uh, scenario, which is uh, in compliance with the 1.5 degree difference, and it's uh, initially uh, compared to a scenario of inaction. So I'm not taking any action whatsoever in the climate uh, um, area. And it's compared to the so-called uh, scenario of um, declared policies, which is within the global climate agreement and the process of the UN uh, C, uh, where countries have stated their nationally defined contribution until the year uh, 2100, uh, which right now are bringing us to increase in global temperature by at least three degrees, which is uh, two, de uh, two times higher than the goal uh, stipulated in the Paris Climate Agreement. So what are we seeing on the slide here? On the columns to the left, um, we see the uh, sum of uh, 59 billion euro which constitutes the losses which Bulgaria would accrue if Bulgaria were to not undertake any actions whatsoever in the climate area, which are losses directly related to climate uh, uh, disasters, um, 
the other number around 22 billion is the average on the EU level. So you can see that we are among the big losers if we fail to take enough ambitious action. So the Bulgarian value of losses is approximately one fifth or one sixth of the total losses on the uh, European Union level. The uh, columns to the right are the losses if we take some moderate middle of the road um, measures compared to the currently uh, announced policies until the year 2100. We see a huge difference between taking no climate actions and taking moderate climate action. Uh, but the numbers in those two columns are losses that could be avoided if we were to follow the Paris Accord, the Paris uh, Climate Agreement uh, uh, numbers and the targets. Okay, we talked about losses, but also climate action uh, gives us uh, con very consistently uh, social and economical benefits, which are added to the losses that we have been able to avoid. What would those uh, social and economical benefits be? There are some examples included in the um, cost assessment of the in the report. We are talking about improved. Uh, indicators of uh, population health, increased number of uh, uh, workplaces in the new green industry, talking about decreasing uh, energy poverty, uh, decreasing the uh, footprint uh, uh, or the uh, improvement of uh, resource efficiency of the economy. Another very specific example of uh, uh, co-benefits would be uh, when we're taking actions to avoid uh, air pollution, additional additional benefits accrue, such as improved uh, quality of environmental quality, improved health outcomes, uh, and uh, improved uh, levels of energy poverty. Now, let's look at the numbers once again. As uh, a benchmark, we have... Uh, taken the numbers of the gross domestic product, GDP, for the um, European Union countries for 2020 uh, compared to uh, the projected levels for 2030. So 9.2% of the Bulgarian GDP would be the additional contribution or the additional uh, benefits or revenue for the country if we were to follow the 1.5 degree a scenario. As you see, this level is much higher than the average for the European Union and practically this is the second highest value after the value for Slovakia. From a um, monetary point of view, these average benefits are equal to 6.7 billion euro cumulatively until 2030. And um, we have benefits for the energy system, the energy security, on the one hand, talking about uh, avoided import of um, uh, of uh, fossil fuels, and then uh, also the benefits from uh, not using fossil fuels or the alternative uh, fuels. And uh, resource uh, efficiency is also added here. The whole life cycle of fossil fuels is being reviewed here. We're also talking about uh, uh, savings from import of raw materials, uh, health benefits are also a key element of the total benefits here. We're talking about uh, decreased level of mortality on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, decreased uh, um, uh, prevalence uh, because of the population having been exposed to a very high level of uh, 2.5 micron uh, um, dust particles. Um, another number that we need to outline from this slide is the number of jobs, which are uh, evaluated as at least uh, 68.5 thousand um, new jobs, additional green jobs, which would um, be created 
in the new green industries um, if um, we are, would follow the 1.5 degree scenario. Um, several more words about the health risks. On the slide, you see uh, OECD data uh, from 2019. Once again, taking a look at the country's uh, GDP, we have the EU member states so GDP here, Bulgaria has the highest value again, which means 14% of the GDP is being lost on an annual basis because of exposure of our population to levels of fine dust particles. Um, these values are similar to the values of other countries outside of EU, such as Serbia, Bosnia, and Ukraine, as an example. I just wanted to say that there is some um, uh, research uh, based on the health uh, benefits to avoid pollution, uh, giving some more uh, different uh, health uh, benefits and more conservative levels. Uh, and another central conclusion uh, as a result of our or outcome of our report, and so the EU level, uh, this. Uh, schedule on the left. Uh, these are the additional costs uh, for the realization of the 1.5 degree scenario. So these um, uh, intensified or more ambitious climate measures. Uh, in the middle, you have the uh, uh, co-benefits at the EU level. And on the right, there is the upper and lower limit of the climate uh, losses, which could be avoided. Uh, on the right, we see that the benefits are significantly outpacing the costs for the necessary transformation on the EU level. And um, prior to publishing the report in January, uh, the colleagues couldn't uh, uh, take the uh, uh, level of the national states about how much the transition would cost. But now the Comparison is available, and the report is preparing to report this, um, this data as well. Uh, right now, as I already mentioned, this is quite clear that what we are being scared by, um, by multiple politicians, is that the cost for the green and energy transition would exceed um, the benefits that we are going to get from them uh, by a lot. It's actually quite the opposite. And that is why we need to take uh, um, very uh, quick action on uh, acting on uh, preventing uh, climate change. And through our report, we're practically uh, presenting initial economic data, which uh, confirm the benefits to the economy and there is multiple benefits um, for the public uh, the different uh, uh, the members of the public and uh, the citizens and the climate thank you radi you were absolutely perfect with the timing um what was impressive for me because i think this presentation is a very good example of how to present uh, policies in terms of climate adaptation because they sound very abstract. Uh, when we when they say we need to reach a percentage and a half, and we need to cut uh, emissions. We see the approach when there is an economic analysis and clear data. What could this result in improving the quality of life, the income, and uh, therefore the people's um, living standards? And this connection we, we've been trying to reinforce it for years uh, the team of uh, Zazemiata they sound very logical correct and clear but when we have uh, um, uh, slogans and uh, I mean everything else uh, Radi presented to us data which clarifies why we need to do this uh, in this way are there any other questions to Radi? Yeah, I, there are questions, but uh, let me just say that the benefits that we basically 
uh, outlined uh, with uh, the colleagues uh, uh, are conservative and the stronger actions in terms of energy efficiency, uh, such as, for example, development of renewable costs, uh, which is not being taken into consideration, including this in the equation would make the benefits even more significant for the economy. Uh, yeah, and I think this approach uh, that when I started initially being interested in climate policies, this was the uh, end of 2007, there was a report by Nicholas Stern, who was the uh, you know, former um, uh, uh, principal economist of the World Bank. Uh, uh, basically, at the end of 2007, uh, the report didn't have the same numbers, but he was saying, how much it would cost if we fail to take the necessary measures and how much it would not cost if we were to take them and we didn't. So now let's give the floor to Petko Kovacic, who is uh, a, uh, well, to his, he's been in still is my friend for many years now. And he's the Green Policy Institute, head of the Green Policy Institute to make uh, an assessment on the uh, 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 critical uh, uh, assessment of the recovery plan. Well, it's critical, but I'm going to start with something else. Uh, yesterday, uh, uh, Daniel Kahneman died, uh, the person who won the Nobel Prize uh, in economics on the topic of how we take uh, um, economic decisions, and they are far away from the standard uh, paradigm of economics and maximizing utility. And um, they are based on other psychological uh, factors, which uh, are not always rational. Quite the contrary, they're very often irrational. And in the morning part of the discussion in particular, um, it uh, showcased how uh, the national decisions are dominating, but sometimes they're dominating uh, in uh, making things uh, great. And that's what happened uh, with the National Recovery and Resiliency Plan. So back in the, the beginning of last year, uh, by uh, upon a request uh, by Zazvimiat, uh, I did a analysis of the progression of the plan uh, in October, the middle of the last year, in uh, comparison on getting the second payment for the plan. They were directed toward the actions uh, on the plan of reforms and investments uh, related to the green transformation, the climate, uh, uh, energy and environment, the report you, you can be found in the website of the coalition, um, the Green Coalition and the Zazimiata website as well. Um, I'm going to mention three things in particular, and this is the first thing that I'm going to mention. As of this time, this is the table containing the information about where we are. The second payment is, uh, is has not been received yet, and there is no official information as of yesterday about the 653 million euro which have uh, arrived. Quite the contrary, they are still pending. And it's unclear, and again, there is no information on how the commission uh, looks at these uh, four goals that haven't been met yet, which is, by the way, very important for all of us. This is the law on the personal bankruptcy. The other ones are not relevant, but this one is. At the same time, Payment three and four are already outstanding, which were supposed to have wrapped up by end of last year, 2023. And um, uh, at the moment, we see that the uh, interim goals have been met respectively for the 15 compared to 31 uh, and six against uh, 31. So the interim targets uh, is the prerequisite for receiving the respective uh, uh, payment tranches. And these are commitments that the country has voluntarily taken. No one has forced us to, to, to accept them. Yeah, they are based on the report, but I am going to explain in detail about this in, in a minute. 
but basically the fifth payment deadline is in June this year and it's already knocking on the door. And you see that we are delayed massively. Even though Bulgaria has not received the second payment yet, uh, we are exposing to risk about 2.4 billion euro because these are deadlines that are very, very risky. And even though we may get to the second one, there's also 1.5 billion left. And the sixth payment is by the end of 2024. And because the payments have been broken down by six-month periods, and every six-month period has two quarters, which uh, breaks down the measures and the targets and the goals and objectives. Um, which is, by the way, the next thing that we're going to discuss, uh, we see the delay in which we find ourselves. Why and how is the third part of what I am going to say, if I may just move to the other table. It's not the same file. Uh, can I get to the other file? Okay, let's see. Thank you. Yes, the second the second table will be about the changing of the deadlines, um, their movement forward in time in different stages and uh, by different goals. This is a bit of a draft version of the table, uh, but it is what it is. What I'm uh, showing here is that from the stages and goals are set for completion in 2023. 16 plus 2 plus 1 of them. 19 of them were moved forward to next uh, year's uh, 2024, 25, and 26. From 2024, respectively, the uh, 6... 13 and 1 were moved to the subsequent years, 2025 and 2026. And from uh, the first quarter of 2026, the proposal is to move uh, three to the latest po possible period. So this is the second risk indicator for the fulfillment of the plan. Uh, therefore, the promises that uh, certain things will uh, happen uh, in certain quarters based on uh, whose performance Bulgaria will receive the interim payments. Actually, this is proposed to be postponed. And how this is going to affect the payments themselves is interesting because here the commission may agree with the changes or not. And therefore, and also it can agree with the payments or not. It can refuse to provide payments. And because we don't have enough accessible public information about the negotiations, we are in a situation of uh, where we are uh, waiting uh, either a message from the media or notification or uh, via unofficial channels, we receive information about what's going on. So these two tables are the measurable, visible aspect of the risks. Therefore, how the risks to not receive funds under the plan. And uh, this is how they can be visualized. A, with the, with the desire of the Bulgarian government to uh, postpone um, uh, various goals and stages further and further away in time, which also uh, poses a risk in the uh, short uh, time uh, amount of time we have uh, between 2024 and 2025. We uh, face the risk of um, having to do more than Bulgarian institutions can realistically accomplish, which can lead to delay of the payments. We also have a group of problems that uh, are not in a table. I will mention them, and these problems reveal the deeper threats to the success of the plan uh, uh, in 2026. As you might see, if you're, we've listed a, a series of risks that 
who were already existing as obstacles to the successful uh, completion of the interim goals. And we can see they're still present. So the first one is the political risk, the complete instability of Bulgaria currently since 2021. We have had so many elections, and before that, we had the so uh, called uh, stability of Borisov's government and GERP, uh, the political party uh, who prepared the first and extremely bad version of this plan. And the, all of the delays started uh, from the preparation of this plan for resilience and recovery. Uh, I remember that because I have written opinions and I've read opinions about it. So all of this uh, continues to uh, put the fulfillment of the plan into jeopardy. And it's not only because politicians can't uh, get on board uh, or we don't have a government, but also because Bulgaria doesn't have a functional administration that can operate in a crisis situation uh, the Bulgarian state administration, for example, is not like the Belgian one which uh, functioned for two years and a half without a government. And uh, Belgium didn't collapse, didn't go bankrupt, nothing bad happened. On the contrary, the Bulgarian state administration bears the risks of all of the political instability, plus a few extra risks. Of course, there is the risk that here our listeners or the audience at large, maybe they won't uh, understand. But this is the resistance of certain circles in Bulgaria against the proposals, solutions, and even policies of the European Union. And we need to keep repeating that because that resistance uh, it poses a threat not just to the recovery plan, but to many other activities. Here I'm talking about the uh, trade unions and syndicates, these two groups of social partners that have uh, arrived at the idea that they are the most important ones, the greatest, and so on, they directly confronted uh, the uh, policies about the hydroelectric plants and uh, about uh, coal plants. Uh, they confronted the territorial transition and uh, opposed everything. And we, could, we saw uh, Benkov's government fold before the requests of these uh, trade unions, which is a bad sign because from that time onward, anyone who tries to uh, extort um, the future Bulgarian government, they uh, can depend on, they, they can be successful. The other risk, of course, is the geopolitical risk, which is twofold. First, the ongoing war, but also the risk of a complete shift in the policy of the European Union after the European elections. And then uh, even the existing uh, contracts may be fulfilled, but the future endeavors may have to be renegotiated. This is, of course, a, um, an unknown factor, so there's no point to uh, discuss it more, but we have to keep an eye on this risk. Something else which is good to be aware of, which puts the plan uh, into jeopardy from internal events and changes, is the fact that this plan is not actually a strategic document. It's not a national development strategy. It's not a sectoral development strategy. This plan has certain elements from different strategies. It borrowed a few projects, added a few new ones that were not there. And um, it's just a quick response to the uh, to the goal to receive and utilize certain funds uh, by the end of 2026. However, since Bulgaria doesn't have adequate strategic planning, uh, and that follows logical roles. But also, we don't have uh, the administrative and political capacity for 
quick and reasonable responses to change. Because of that, the plan has some indeed very good and valuable solutions, but some other ones that are questionable. And this is uh, evidenced um, by the this desire to change things, to change fundings, to change deadlines. Uh, this problem is a problem overall to the country, as I mentioned, and all subsequent documents or agreements for funding are facing the same risk. And uh, this risk is systemic to Bulgaria, I think. We can see what's happening to the integrated energy and climate plan, to the transport strategies, to the climate strategies. I have talked to people about the energy efficiency plans and other sectors. Uh, that It turns out that strategic planning is a problem everywhere in Bulgaria. And when we need to actually uh, do specific goals and steps that are part of a plan, because they have to be, uh, uh, not because we understand that they're necessary, this is what happens. We have a document for billions of euro uh, and it's uh, facing a risk of not being successful because of a lack of uh, completion. And I also think that uh, we are facing a risk for the reason that we don't know how we don't know what the Commission uh, doesn't uh, want. We don't know what Bulgaria wants. And the information that's circulated from time to time in Bulgaria media, like uh, we will give the money for energy efficiency or we will give the money for gas or uh, talks like that. These are part of this general air of uncertainty. Um, where we keep uh, talking about forecasts and plans and wishes and uh, everyone is trying to prove that their plan is the best. But at the end of the day, all of these uh, talks and uncertainties and some other factors that I'm not sure I should... Anyway, anyway, let, let's not digress. I will finish with a quote that perhaps I have mentioned to uh, my friends, but I won't uh, mention any names, but uh, it was it's from a person who was working at the Ministry of Energy at the time. And that person told me uh, straight after a meeting, and this trend hasn't changed. The quote is, we will give the documents to Brussels. The documents will say what Brussels wants to see. But what we are going to accomplish here, only we know, and they won't be telling us what to do. So this is the, the greatest risk, in my opinion, not just to uh, for the recovery plan, but for all of our undertakings, because everyone loves European money. But when it's time to... Uh, meet your obligations, everyone becomes uh, obvious or hidden Eurosceptic, and that's bad. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's go. Now, I'm sorry that I uh, promised that the second part of today will be more positive, but Petko brought us right back to reality. I am depressed again. <laughs> Do we have any questions for him? Okay. So about the recovery plan, indeed, uh, it's obvious we have uh, more uncertainties and question marks than anything. Just uh, may I ask, when are you going to update your uh, report? I'm being serious because as uh, Petkus showed in the first table, uh, six months have, have passed and we already need an update. This is important because another uh, because this type of analysis is very useful. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Georgi, for the question. I will give Petko the op opportunity to answer. And we are planning uh, for a new version of the report. We hoped uh, compliance of, with the, and implementation of the reforms and investments to move forward, to give us something more to tell 
in the next version, but I I was raising my hand because I wanted to say that one of the main risks is uh, the uh, lack of uh, is missing funds. But another problem is the quality of the reforms and the legislative changes that are being implemented. And here, once again, we have considerable risks of uh, just getting stuck with bad decisions that we can't uh, get out of. And uh, we really need a broad public oversight for the implementation of the reforms and investments of the plan. And we need uh, public cons consultations for each separate topic and a lot of discussions uh, to make sure that the benefit actually reaches the uh, regular people uh, and doesn't just remain with certain interest groups. So uh, if you want to add to that, yes. I just want to confirm what you said, because when we have nothing to report, apart from some uh, nebulous negotiations, for example, they announced the procedure for new capacities plus uh, batteries, and uh, uh, this is how they report compliance for three payment periods. Uh, but this is not actually considerable progress or when they announced changes to the Energy Effectiveness Act by changing the name of the Energy Efficiency Fund to the National Decarbonization Fund. We really need something real uh, to happen to be able to analyze it. So you're trying to say that the approach of just changing uh, the names of uh, different projects is not the right approach. Uh, well, we, we can always just change names, but this is not real work. Uh, here you are, Professor Vasilev, you have the floor. Thank you. I would like to share an observation I have from recent years about the expert potential uh, uh, that is being used in the development of the National Plan for uh, Recovery and Resilience. We need to say that Bulgaria have the expert potential, and these experts are not being used. Instead, uh, the potential is being used of colleagues from the Ministry of Energy uh, and other organizations, but uh, they have excellent professionals. We, I have to say, but technology develops incredibly rapidly, especially the energy storage technology. And there, uh, for that, the national experts were not really used properly. Uh, the potential of uh, the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences and uh, people in the business sector. Instead, uh, we only have a closed clique of people who are working in some mysterious ways uh, that are not transparent and uh, they produce something that is just not aligned with reality. And yesterday I watched, for example, on TV, someone said they are uh, will provide 124 million lefts to update uh, street lights. But for that project, the documentation was prepared by colleagues from the ministry. And in this department, we have excellent experts, but they are working on such a broad spectrum of questions, coal, gas, renewables, uh, nuclear, and so on and so forth. And lighting is something so small and it's kind of a side question, but uh, so much work has been done for that in recent years. And I would like to appeal to uh, change the way of work and to use all available um, experts in Bulgaria because not using them is a crime. It's criminal to not use that potential. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's difficult to uh, service the interest of lobbies if we use all potential experts. Uh, this is why I try to uh, select our panelists. Uh, we have uh, excellent experts here, but people are just not using these expert opinions. And here I'm giving the floor to another expert, Maria Trifonova. Hello, I'm glad to see you. I am a bit uh, late to join the discussion, but this is the part about solutions, isn't it? Until now, we were talking about uh, things that I know everyone knows and has known for a long time and nothing's changing. And it's uh, such a huge disappointment for all of us to see that 
the fate and well-being of millions of people in the country are being determined by a few individuals in the state administration who I don't believe have even read uh, current up-to-date reports. And I don't think they are abreast of the rapid technological change. As And as someone who works with science and technology, I am seeing how much other countries are uh, gaining speed and are getting ahead of us in terms of working with their science and uh, their universities and business sector uh, in partnership to develop uh, technology. And uh, they position everything uh, in an interconnected ecosystem for um, supply chains and delivery of specific technologies and this is strengthening their economies and uh, since we're talking about solutions I would like to share something that we are trying to make happen and develop in the um, upcoming months uh, what was mentioned uh, a few moments ago for us it's very interesting uh, how, how in the Sofia University the so-called uh, strategic and energy technology plan is being uh, fulfilled in, and Bulgaria has no participation in the performance of this plan. We are not even talking about the plan, even though the National Energy and Climate Plan is saying that we need actions uh, about, we need to show how our country is contributing for the implementation of this plan in Bulgaria too and uh, for the development of these types of technologies and their integration. And uh, because it was recent that it was mentioned that indeed some universities and institutes uh, and the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences, they are running some pro projects in this area that are developing and they're contributing, but uh, not a lot is known about them. Often these projects are isolated. And what we start doing initially is we uh, map the work and efforts of, of the researchers and scientists working on this topic. And our next important goal is since Bulgaria is represented by all 13 working groups in the platform uh, on the European Union uh, level that is monitoring for the implementation of the set plan. And out of these 13 groups, with the exception of my participation in one of them, we have the participation of an administrative representative that I uh, can't even uh, get in touch with for nuclear safety. And we have a colleague of mine from the Technical University who is participating in the work group or platform for innovations and technologies related to system flexibility. With the exception of these three people, we have no other repre uh, representatives. This is why uh, mapping to us means not just to find out what's happening and where, and to make that information public, but also we would really like to uh, create a coordination unit for that. We have set aside some funds in the budget to uh, try and make sure that experts are represented in each working group and not just to be able to say what the priorities of the commission are, but also to contribute to the discussions for the Horizon program and uh, to contribute for the technology priorities and the way these programs are being structured. And um, we are planning a round table discussion in May, uh, in the month of May on this topic. And here, I don't know whom to appeal to from the ministries. Of course, uh, the Ministry of Innovation and the Ministry of Energy are natural partners for this. But my plea to you is if you have any knowledge about specific innovative projects that are being developed for energy technology, innovations, and please share your knowledge with us and join us um, in our roundtable discussion because this is indeed so important, not just talking about uh, public procurements and maybe developing uh, hydroelectric power, but also we need to show how we are contributing for the development of these technologies. And I am so disappointed about how little is known about the progress of Europe and the European technology, technology companies in the field of uh, integration and implementation of key technologies for low carbon energy. Recently, uh, we had a statistic that showed that Bulgarian scientists overall had the lowest amount of participation in various scientific and research projects in the entire European Union. But this, and this, uh, this is a huge topic 
And um, by the way, by the end, uh, Maria, you can answer a question that was uh, raised this morning about the open training for nuclear experts in the business uh, faculty. No, the master's degree program. Uh, so does the science uh, side of things know more than us? Thanks to Maria, I would like to say that for years uh, we have been striving. I uh, have been acting through the NGOs and she has, she has been acting through the science side of things to attract the information of politicians and to uh, achieve reasonable solutions. I'm glad that she's still struggling. And to, um, indeed, it is, for example, I can say that for years now, when we visit these uh, meetings under the uh, umbrella of the United Nations about climate policies, we see there that we never have scientists. So the Bulgarian delegation never has scientists. It only has politicians and uh, functionaries. And this is uh, preposterous uh, to go to a climate policy meeting and have no climatologists and climate experts. This is just another example of the problem. Just to add to something that Maria said, uh, for European technology, uh, we have a very active... Uh, PR smear campaign that is ongoing for European technology. We keep hearing about how the European hydro industry is in its decline, how Europe is uh, losing competitiveness, but we can only use competitiveness uh, due to the all of the talk about these topics because this is the big race and we need to invest in these technologies and everyone in the world is competing to create the cheapest, most ecological and most circular hydroelectric technologies. And we want the European Union to say, okay, we tried, uh, we created some solutions while it was expensive, but there's no more point to work for this. Yes, indeed. And uh, the media environment is extremely aggressive and hostile. And we know the reason. Uh, the, because just uh, we don't have a lot of media independence, unfortunately. Now let us pass the floor to Georgi Stefano from the uh, Board of Directors of the Geothermal Energy Association. I have uh, presented him for many other uh, in many other roles. Now this is how we meet him. Hello, dear colleagues. Thank you for the invitation. Let us come back to go back to the topic about the nuclear power plant and what is the best technologically sound solution but before i start let me just comment on uh, our latest q and a discussions about why bulgaria is uh, here there is a very readable policy brief by the european parliament that explains the processes of liberalization of energy that started in 1998 26 years ago and with its uh, five packages the first package is the uh, um, fighting the monopolies, removing the monopolies. Uh, and with the situation of our energy, we still haven't uh, accomplished this. Then we have the third, uh, second, third, and fourth, and fifth, the last package, which is uh, planned for uh, 2055. And when we're looking for solutions about answers, about why things are not happening uh, in Bulgaria in the right way, the simple reason is that we haven't changed the fundamental level of our economy, uh, uh, which will create a foundation on which we can step and move forward and uh, uh, then impl implement innovations and modernize. So uh, it's like uh, getting an old car, putting new tires on it and expecting to get a Ferrari. This just can't happen. All of these strategic and financial documents and instruments that the European Union is providing to Bulgaria, has been providing for 16 years now, they aim for Bulgaria to compensate this economic and political deficiency that it has in order to try and uh, uh, achieve some progress and uh, get closer to the average economic well-being levels of Europe. But, but we are 
intentionally sabotaging and boycotting this and the European Commission, uh, Commission is at a loss because we are the country with the largest number of uh, penal procedures and uh, the European Commission cannot act like Putin and invade Ukraine. Uh, they can only impose sanctions on us and stop our funding from time to time. But the problem here is mostly caused by the and directly related to the fact that the status quo of uh, fossil fuels and conventional uh, power production and monopolies is still strong. And uh, anything that tries to change that is being blocked. But let us uh, go back to the topic of geothermal energy now. This is the only technology that is uh, can compete with the capacity of a nuclear power plant in terms of base uh, capacity. And in the next 20 ish minutes i will tell you about it because this is a mostly unknown topic but let me first tell you about the bulgarian association for geothermal energy it's a new association it was going to get registered before the covid crisis but it registered after the first waves of covid in 2021 and it is an organization that collects brings together the fundamental geoscience and all aspects of development of the geothermal energy in terms of the climate and uh, technological and financial benefits and uh, expert assistance and implementation of geothermal projects. What uh, the association is trying to accomplish uh, and has been trying for in the recent years is to mobilize this idea. And I have a, a, a role. I was a scientific observant, observer in the first geothermal project in uh, Budapest uh, years ago when I was working for the WWF and that helped me get to know the innovation aspect of this uh, solution. And now here I should say that geothermal energy is not uh, truly an innovation because this technology is uh, not terribly complicated and uh, geothermal energy systems have been existing uh, for a hundred years. And in Bulgaria, we have had this for 50 years now. In, so it's not rocket science. We just need to remember the benefits of this technology. Uh, uh, a few words about the results. In By the way, in the recovery plan, we have such a pilot investment uh, project uh, that uh, I authored and co-authored and we have uh, reworked uh, an infinite number of times. So this is another one of my roles. But anyway, in terms of, in terms of uh, reforms for in this plan, we had important legislative changes because uh, geothermal energy is not even uh, doesn't even exist in uh, the purely legal realm. And in the beginning of last year, with a few quick amendments, we introduced the first main definitions of geothermal energy in the Energy from Renewable Sources Act. I have quoted them here on uh, no need to read everything. Uh, these are the definitions of geothermal energy, geothermal system, uh, low temperature, medium temperature, and high temperature geothermal energy. We introduced this. And uh, when you don't have these definitions in the legal framework, uh, then there's no foundation to do anything, really. Now, what uh, is uh, in blue underlined, uh, this is a hyperlink to the definitions and uh, legislative texts. You can read them. Now, in the next stage, at the end of the year, we um, adopted uh, much more detailed amendments to the uh, various Bulgarian acts and uh, legislation and this happened uh, thanks to the work of our team in the first half of the year we created a legal analysis of the uh, legislation of 10 european countries and here let me say that there is no european uh, regulatory framework that provides a clear direction for development of this technology and so each country member state is left either develops it for itself or doesn't uh, geothermal energy and uh, high depth geothermal energy is part of the hypothesis of is uh, in the same area as drilling for underground mineral resources. 
now uh, you need to know that we have a new under underground resource and this is heat and this is why we added uh, these uh, definitions of geothermal resources to the law and we faced a lot of obstacles uh, making the state administration accept this topic because it's uh, hard to make them realize that heat is a resource I could speak at length about this, but anyways, we made things happen, could have been better, but nevertheless it happened. Now let's just look at the global picture, because we have lots of countries that are developing this uh, energy source. This is uh, the one gigawatt country club, countries that have a one gigawatt installed geo uh, electric uh, energy, and here I'm talking just about electrical power, not about thermal power, by the way. So uh, here I'm talking only about the electrical side of things, uh, electricity from geothermal resources. You need to know that Turkey is a uh, leader in the world on a global stage in terms of developing uh, geothermal energy production capacities. Uh, the United States are first, but it's interesting what other uh, neighbors are doing, like uh, Croatia, Slovenia and others, uh, and uh, Hungary, who are undergoing rapid development. And here, because in the previous panel we talked about uh, geothermal energy being expensive, and specifically electricity production, here's uh, the data from the official reports of the International uh, um, Agency for Renewable Energy Sources, IRENA. This shows the average values for 2022. And it's in the next uh, chart, you will see that those prices vary from 2000 to 6000 US dollars per kilowatt uh, installed capacity. And the average value is between three and 4000 US dollars. It's uh, rare to see uh, projects under $3,000 per kilo kilowatt hour. And this is uh, very specific because it all depends on the depth of the drilling. And the depth of the drilling is the source of the cost of this uh, electricity. And here you can see the same parameters. Until recently, we were talking about uh, how difficult it is to make forecasts, but it's interesting to see what happened in the last 10 years. And if you look at 2010 and the costs, investment costs for uh, construction, they were 2,900 and in 2022, they're 2,500. The capacity factor, uh, the production capacity is a, a key factor here. In this report by Irene, uh, Irene, you can see a comparison of geothermal with other renewable energy sources. And in the next slides, I have compared them to all other energy sources, especially to nuclear power. And here you can see the difference. If we need to compare the values from 2010, uh, back then geothermal cost 2,900 US dollars and solar cost uh, uh, 500 and 100. And uh, there in solar, we have a significant uh, reduction. Uh, and in geothermal power, we have a 20% uh, increase instead. So this is not the end of the world, of course. Here we're talking about economies of scale and production capacity too. So we can compare all technologies and their cost uh, going back into time. And um, something else that's interesting is the cost of the end product, which is the electricity. Uh, the more important data is in this uh, table that uses official data from the American Environmental Agency and the uh, Department of Energy. And I've selected this um, data because in the United States, the market is less regulated and more uh, market uh, sensitive and so this helps us create a more realistic picture. Uh, the col first column shows the percentage of uh, working hours per year for geothermal energy or the so-called capacity factor. Yes, the nuclear power plant indeed has the highest uh, parameters but uh, it's uh, followed by geothermal energy um, right behind it with 85%. 
the construction period is five uh, years for geothermal and uh, the exploitation period is 60 plus. I've averaged the price uh, parameters to four in to make uh, the everything uh, easy to remember. The uh, disposal period is also important. Uh, geothermal is two years and for uh, NPP it's much longer. And when we are talking about the finished product, it's important to mention that geothermal creates electricity, heat, and uh, cooling, uh, which is much better than uh, nuclear power. And you, we can. It's important to compare to all other energy sources as well. And as we mentioned, geothermal energy is the least affected by climate change. It's uh, not being affected by uh, rainfall, by uh, natural disasters, because it's an underground resource in the Meantime, it can uh, provide ensure uh, both large scale and small scale projects based on local differences. I will not be commenting about other uh, sources, but I'm sure the colleagues can upload other presentations. It's uh, obvious that uh, nuclear power is the most expensive and the slowest one. Okay, I have another 15 minutes. Okay, so we have around 20 to 25 minutes each. I'm going to continue a little bit more. So the theoretical potential about geothermal energy in Europe, according to the Geothermal Center, the potential is assessed as 22 gigawatts uh, until 2030 and 522 gigawatts for 2050. Right now, there are 2.5 uh, gigs in EU and around 100 projects are being currently developed. And uh, these are hyperlinks to the sources. These are not our data. These are official data. Um, the industry evaluations and the report of the European Parliament geothermal energy can um, fulfill uh, upwards of 75% of the consumption of for uh, heating and cooling energy by 2040 or 2050. Look at the geothermal potential situated uh, in Europe. Do you recognize where Bulgaria is? Um, here on the bottom part of the map on the right, we have mineral waters. Mineral water are not geothermal resources, though. Because of the hot, um, um, basically, geothermal situation, we have mineral water, but we shouldn't equate the two. So this map showcases where the project existing projects are, and we see that Bulgaria is a blind spot on this map. But we do have a lot of uh, upside, a lot of uh, potential. If we take a look at the um, countries and the projects, which are listed here in this slide, uh, there is a series of uh, states that have uh, small and medium projects. The total and south capacity is around 3.5 gigawatts. And around a third of those are being built currently. So soon we're going to surpass the global leader in the United States of America, which is uh, a bit um, uh, more towards the top. Now, this is this was for 2022. Right now, the data for 2023 is being drafted. But the Ukraine war did create a boom uh, in uh, this technology. This is a much more uh, efficient, energy efficient compared to all other uh, technologies, including conventional and uh, amongst the renewable energy sources. And the benefits of uh, not having a common European uh, framework for this uh, this was launched two or three years ago with the development of the strategy for thermal uh, pumps. And now there is a resolution of the European Parliament, if you may note here, 96% support in the European Parliament. At this mandate, in this Parliament, there is no other topic that has gathered so much or garnered so much support. Uh, in the... Uh, um, adoption was uh, at a similar rate in Bulgaria and the Bulgarian Parliament. So. This is not a politically topic of political division. And so this is the set plan. Um, and thank you to Milcha for uh, raising this topic. I'm among the people who are reading a lot. And this is the issues coming from the fact that we don't take the scientific uh, resolutions or the scientific um, solutions as part of the normal uh, cycle of economic development. Um, the state administration doesn't want to hear this. Uh, we've uh, commented this with my colleague a lot. Uh, so 
a little bit on Bulgaria, the Bulgarian potential. We have uh, uh, two main ge geologic structures in Bulgaria, northern and southern geological provinces. There, there is a uh, some serious potential. Uh, I'm not going to go into specifics, but uh, recently we had um, an opinion, uh, joint opinion with the Integrated Committee on uh, Energy. Northern Bulgaria is very well uh, researched. These uh, red uh, points or dots that you see on the map are already uh, poor hosts for oil and petrol and gas. And in the southern part, uh, we don't have um, uh, we don't have data, but the suspicions of geologists and extrapolations and calculations are being done on, based on uh, borehole data. And if they don't have borehole data, they do those uh, geological structures. Uh, Bulgaria has no boreholes below 2,000 meters, and it's a huge deficit. And then the resilience and recovery plan with uh, uh, stipulated uh, these uh, boreholes and uh, deep, so the deep geology in Bulgaria for a potential up to uh, below 2,600 meters is what allow us uh, to be part of the economical uh, feasibility. This is the highest cost. Uh, each business would know uh, what is there underground in terms of uh, heat resources. Geothermal um, energy is uh, raising between 25 and 40 degrees per kilometer, which uh, means basically that our country uh, would have an abundance of um, low temperature uh, sources, which is very good for uh, heating up small residential areas and public buildings and so on. And uh, for the high potential between 100 and 150 degrees and even the higher uh, temperatures, which allow us to generate electricity uh, exist. It's very important to know what geothermal resources and what geothermal energy means. And the very important thing is that geothermal resource should not be mistaken with the hot mineral water. The water is the function of the heat, not... A, the geothermal resource that we have this is part of the error in the integrated plan, which says we have no potential because uh, we have uh, not so much uh, uh, mineral water. Uh, now, here on this slide, I am explaining the temper use of the temperature potential. Um, this image says the same. Uh, it provides an opportunity for clear understanding uh, on the applicability, the environmental and energy aspect. I am moving on because with the opinion that we sent uh, here on the process of update of, of the updated uh, plan for climate and energy, we did an extrapolation of the possible uh, potential that could be realized until 2030 based on public geological data on boreholes existing in the country, the potential of the and resource based on the data from the boreholes and the GEC evaluation on the prognosis of annual growth. And this is the possibility to reach these numbers. Uh, until 2032, uh, when MPAC is over, there will be a two year period of verification and approval. That's why we have uh, stipulated it like that. I'd say these are very conservative uh, expert evaluations. We had a lot of discussions with the experts on Ultimately, we reached a conclusion that 15,000 megawatt hours for direct personal use for cooling and heating, uh, we can uh, reach until 2032, 33,000 megawatts uh, um, thermal energy and 200 megawatts uh, uh, electrical power. This is not unrealistic, and there's actually some uh, investment plans uh, after the publication of the program. This is what the situation looks like after 2050. This is very conservative data. 300,000 megawatt uh, hours, which is 30,000 households, uh, 30,000 megawatts of uh, heating uh, energy, but the heating energy is the one that uh, has the highest level of applicability on the uh, use of uh, geothermal uh, potential. And 1,500, 2,000 megawatts for electrical power until uh, 2050, which could uh, 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 basically result in a third of the consumption on a daily basis. Of course, nothing in this uh, uh, sphere or this area is easy to achieve, 
we have uh, technological maturity, investment levels, uh, fossil energy price uh, competition, but first of all is the geology deficits and uh, low level of knowledge of the deep geology in Bulgaria because these boreholes simply um, have not been done. And I'm going to wrap up with the last slide, some conclusions uh, uh, and uh, some opinions. Uh, geothermal energy is almost equal to the capacity of the nuclear power plant. Um, it's uh, three twice as uh, cheap, but three times as short. Uh, but it's still uh, uh, two to four times more expensive uh, compared to photovoltaic power plants. Uh, uh, so sorry, two times uh, more expensive than uh, onshore wind, and almost equal in, uh, in terms of prices offshore winds. Photovoltaics and uh, wind energy are two to four times cheaper than uh, NPP and are built five to ten times faster. But uh, 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 NPP and solar uh, energy would not be the good energy mix because we're missing all the opportunities for innovation, the diversification, covering the peak consumption periods and so on and so on. So the idea is to install different uh, renewable energy source uh, based uh, technologies. Uh, yeah, sure, ge geothermal is twice as expensive uh, as the sun, but it gives us the opportunity to produce 24-7 uh, more than 8,000 hours per year which other renewable energy sources do not have as a, as a capability. And the uh, NPP technology, as uh, the professor earlier mentioned, it's uh, built uh, the slowest and is the only energy solution uh, behind which is uh, hundreds uh, or even thousands of years of costs, which are not calculated in those $6,000 that I indicated. So building these capacities is the uh, economically most... Uh, energy and feasible solution. Thank you. I uh, am uh, done with my presentation. Are there questions to, to Joro? Petka, do you have a question? Uh, sorry, but I need the uh, speaker to use a microphone, otherwise I cannot hear. These are the heating and cooling megawatts. These are thermal pumps. Uh, changes in the legislation actually uh, results in the fact that thermal pumps uh, used to be very complex uh, for coordination with the basin directorate. Right now, they don't need a coordination regime in this uh, regime of the thermal pumps, uh, as I believe at least half of us know. In the next two or three years, this will happen in Bulgaria as well. We all know that the thermal pumps are, pumps are the most effective thing. Okay, this is something that's very positive, as I, as I uh, promised. There's something that is also very positive and is coming. Mm, there is a process uh, for uh, development. I'm not very well uh, cognizant with this data, but I know that the World Bank is doing a similar analysis. And, um, I uh, already did it on the geothermal uh, energy, the previous analysis, but now I'm pretty sure there are new sources and uh, uh, they have reached a uh, deeper understanding, more thorough understanding. Now I'm going to ask uh, uh, Professor Vasilev to step up what he wanted to uh, we wanted to swap the program agenda a bit. Uh, uh, Professor Vasilev is an expert in um, renewable energy resources technologies. Other than being a scientist, he also has a very wide uh, range of uh, access to the business. He has uh, different projects implemented with the business. He has a little bit different outlook. Unfortunately, the coal lobby and the nuclear uh, lobby basically damaged his presentation. So we are going to have to listen to him without the PowerPoint. But um, Let's uh, listen to what he has to say. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Todorov, for your <coughs> for your presentation. Uh, wonderful uh, welcoming words. I'm really sorry that we weren't able to open the presentation from the flash drive, but I'm going to make sure that you have it. I'm going to send it additionally so that uh, it will be available for you. I'm going to kick off my presentation uh, in the role of the uh, price energy in uh, determining the life uh, uh, environmental and family life in the area. Uh, we were used to, to five or 10 or 15 years ago to have, uh, um, you know, uninterrupted access to cheap energy from uh, NPP because from the energy complex, somebody says, took uh, when there was no application to buy uh, emission quotas and so on, uh, uh, stable uh, energy and low price, which made Bulgarian pro uh, um, products uh, competitive and Bulgarian households uh, had minimal uh, costs for electricity and heating. 
over all of those years until uh, right now, things changed uh, drastically. And we were witnesses to some uh, shock levels of prices on the Bulgarian energy uh, exchange, uh, shock prices on uh, heating, uh, uh, central heating software. It's another very deep topic, uh, but it's um, uh, not the subject of uh, today's presentation. Uh, what happens now? The project, uh, Professor Kachir, uh, uh, has introduced you to this, but the expected price for this project for uh, units seven and eight was uh, high enough. So uh, just to summarize, in the United States of America, nobody is thinking um, to build uh, AP-1000 nuclear power plants. That's one. Second, in the United States of America, there is a commercial company, which is called uh, Lazar, which has turned into an institution for price analysis in um, uh, the energy sector. Everything that Lazard uh, prognosticates is supposed to be true. And the projection of Lazard for newly built uh, power plants in the uh, United States uh, technology on AP1000, uh, the price of energy would be $180 per megawatt hour, uh, considering that uh, this uh, price also includes the building of uh, deep uh, geology, uh, those, uh, a repository for nuclear spent nuclear fuel, and we if we have to include this, uh, then the price would go to 210 United States dollars per megawatt hours. And uh, furthermore, this price uh, that uh, exists in the Georgia uh, power plant with two reactors, uh, these were built at the low uh, energy prices and low material prices and low. Um, you know, uh, worker prices. But what happens on the European market? The biggest generator of nuclear power in the European Union, France, uh, declared that they are raising the price of nuclear power from 4.2 euro cent uh, per kilowatt hour to 7 euro cent per kilowatt hour, uh, taking into consideration that the nuclear power plants in France has long ago have been paid off and there is just operational running costs and uh, existing uh, deep uh, geological um, repositories for the nuclear uh, waste, uh, which includes spent nuclear fuel, operational costs, and uh, employment salaries. Whereas here, uh, in Bulgaria, the price of energy is uh, expected to be AP1002 reactors, would be 65, 70 euro per megawatt hour. This is just not going to happen. And um, taking into consideration that 65% of the costs for uh, nuclear power are capital expenses. But uh, let's go back to the topic at hand. Uh, one of the potential opportunities for us to make a low price and have a low uh, energy price of Bulgarian energy and uh, having low uh, price for Bulgarian households and Bulgarian businesses, these are the photovoltaic power plants. The photovoltaic power plants uh, have a long uh, uh, history, but the commercial uh, viability of the units uh, started um, uh, a little bit before 19, the 1970s. Uh, and so one watt peak of a photovoltaic power plant cost 80 US dollars. Uh, right now, as of the moment that we're speaking, in February, the price of the panels uh, in Italy, uh, photovoltaic uh, panels uh, has dropped to 80 euro cents. So we have approximately, with uh, uh, multiple multiple dimensions, so a, a thousand times decrease in the pr uh, price of uh, photovoltaic um, things for a period of uh, 60 years. Is that the end of the decrease of the price of uh, photovoltaic panels? No. Uh, photovoltaic technology has not yet reached its maturity. It's still being developed. And the maturity of uh, photovoltaic uh, technology will be around, uh, I think, uh, 2028, 2030, when you know, the global generation of the photovoltaic power plants and installed power would be around one terawatt. So what is expected to happen uh, uh, with the price of photovoltaic uh, 
power. Uh, the price uh, of it, we expect that by 2030, 2040, 2040, it will be below 15 euro. It will be actually below even 12 euro per megawatt hour. This is the uh, equalize, the level price of the energy. The, 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 the you know, exchange price is uh, quite different. Is it possible? Yes, it's possible. And why is it possible? Because efficiency of the photovoltaic panels is increasing. Currently, the efficiency of mass production is, I would say, the higher level of uh, the higher cost. Let's say it's about 24%. In uh, 2035, 36% is the expected efficiency. And the reason for this is uh, multiple publications which have been published in even the uh, last uh, few months, more than 10 publications which uh, say that we have photovoltaic cells which have uh, efficiency, I think, the best is 40%. So from 30, ranging between 30 and 40 percent efficiency in the um, road from the photovoltaic, photovoltaic cell to the production of a photovoltaic panel is not so long. So we should expect in the years to come um, that the start of the improvement of the efficiency of the panels would uh, exist. Uh, so if it used to be half a percent per year. There could be a 1.5% gain of efficiency per year. And in 2035, uh, we're going to have more than 36% efficiency. What does it mean, though? What it means is that at the same uh, size of the current panel, uh, which is, uh, let's say, around uh, for around uh, 700 watt peaks, you know, single panel, uh, this power would actually exceed uh, more than one kilowatt per panel, or more than 1.1 kilowatt peak of a single panel. So the same cost for a woman on frame now moving towards uh, um, ligature still uh, cost for silicate and perovskite. Uh, and this is how the prime cost of the materials to be used is uh, allocated over a much uh, higher uh, surface area and much more generation capacity. The next thing that comes is, is the, the more low. Uh, every doubling of the uh, annual production uh, on uh, semiconductor elements, uh, the uh, value of the elements decreases by 20%. So the photovoltaic cells are semiconductors themselves. So because of this, um, we are expecting some additional a decrease in prices. Another important question and another important factor for the decrease in prices is this is the uh, panel recycling. The panels right now, the technologies that exist for recycling uh, have more than 100 technologies uh, globally, which uh, have efficiency uh, above 99%. Um, and we're not far away from the time where it's going to go uh, over uh, 90%. 5% uh, solar glass, we're using it. Uh, we're uh, uh, plastics, uh, silicate, um, uh, silicate, sorry, and uh, other rare uh, minerals and elements were going to be used, but from the old panels, because it was legacy technology, one old panel we can use to make. Uh, a new panel, but the old one used to be 300 watts, and now the same one from the recycled material is going to be 600 watts. So the degree of recycling allows us the opportunity to decrease uh, material costs in production of uh, new panels by almost 30%. Um, uh, these are the material costs. Another important question that comes up is uh, now we have the new tech that is being used uh, uh, right now, the connections between the different power cells in the panel have been done through an ultrasound uh, welding. This ultrasound welding uh, is a relatively slow process, which uh, um, is the uh, result of the perfection of these uh, technologies. You get uh, a relatively high number of defects uh, and the uh, product quality was about 15, 20 years. And uh, laser welding cells technology uh, increases the productivity by 20 times, and it provides uh, prerequisites for product guarantee exceeding 25 years. And so these are next gen panels where we can expect uh, 25, 30 years product guarantee of uh, generation guarantee 40 years, which is basically the uh, life cycle of a thermal power plant. So we buy the panel, 
We put them on the roof and we forget about it. And 40, 50 years, they operate noiselessly without vibrations, without emissions, without, <laughs> you know, needing sustenance or water to work. So this is basically this is the workhorse of the family. And our um, uh, basically uh, uh, descendants said, well, you know, our uh, uh, people here did something Maybe we can modernize it. They look online. They look at the companies. They choose the best software. And two specialists are coming in with a bus. They remove the old panels. They put in the uh, new panels. They uh, sell the old ones. And then we back 25% clawback for the value of the new panels installed. And so this energy, we produce it where we consume. And the prognosis for the price of the panels and the highest uh, quality of panels, the most, the modest uh, conservative uh, projection is that their uh, price, we're talking about the high quality panels, two-sided panels. Uh, is Are we okay on time? I'm <laughs> not sure. So basically two-sided panels with uh, efficiency, 25, 26%. Uh, uh, Jingo Solar is the leading company here in the region. But these panels basically would have an efficiency of 36% and uh, therefore their price would be 6 uh, euro cents per watt peak. Now, this sounds like a fairy tale, but let's not forget that just a few months ago, in the beginning of the, sorry, a few years ago, at the beginning of the COVID crisis, it was 25%, so 30, 30 cents, euro cents per watt peak, and now they cost 8 cents per watt peak. So there is a lot of time. Uh, and another factor is, of course, the very high level of uh, competition, the competition between Chinese manufacturers. And I'm going to ask Mr. Petrov to give me a few minutes to uh, tell you about it, because I have no witnesses uh, to this process. I've been visiting fairs and exhibitions and so on. So I have a lot of experience on this topic. That China has done a special financial and technological operations, unlike the operations somewhere else. But... Basically, not a single bullet was fired. Um, the European technologists uh, for Germany, basically, they um, gifted them. And learning the German culture and the German everything, the German, basically, they were banking on the uh, entrepreneurs' um, greed. Come tens and thousands of Europeans, so you have electricity, you're not going to pay for anything cheap. Labor start generating, start producing. They went with their technologies and with their Chinese uh, smartness. Chang Chun works in this company, five kilometers away. The same megapolis, another company, the same technology. They are training him. He work, goes there, works, and now Chinese are the masters of PV tech. Of course, uh, with the support of the Chinese state. With a lot of patents, no one can steal from them. Now, before, they used all the European patents on the in their internal domestic market, and no one could control them. Now things have flipped, and uh, Americans have done their move with the law on the, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act. Basically, they attracted uh, uh, Cisco to do it, but uh, it's uh, Europe is basically fighting for survival. And the only big uh, European uh, producer, Meyer Burger, is basically shutting down the factories in Europe because their products are very expensive. And so under these conditions, when you calculate the cost of energy, and at the same time, by the way, the metal structures, which is very important, uh, the, we are going to need 24% efficiency. The volume uh, of uh, metal is some is one thing, and then in thirty six percent efficiency, we have fifty percent less metal used, and then this metal is also part of the prime cost of the panel, and so the calculated uh, cost uh, is twelve euro cents per watt peak per kilowatt hour, so which means one point two. Tens per kilowatt hour, which means 12 euro per megawatt hour. This low energy prices uh, combined with the new generation of batteries where the price of batteries, as you can see, is an absolute collapse, <laughs> basically, in the price uh, ranges. And um, it's uh, 30 euro per megawatt hour for the batteries. Uh, batteries, solar power plant, uh, this is basically around 25 euro per megawatt hour. 
So this tag we can propose to Bulgarian households, Bulgarian business, Bulgarian communal sector, and uh, the price 25 euro per megawatt hour. And this would provide a level of stability on a Bulgarian production, uh, Bulgarian, Bulgarian uh, uh, households, because uh, GDP, uh, we have a low GDP and a low price, we can uh, basically have this fixed. Thank you, Professor Vasilev. And now it became apparent why they uh, want to build new NPPs for such a price. When you uh, offer them 25, they prefer 160. They think it's uh, more beneficial to their lobby. Yes, Maria? I would like to uh, point out that if you're following the public discourse on the topic, you will understand that solar energy is not considered compet a competitor. On the contrary, uh, right now, there is a dramatic increase of solar uh, capacities in Bulgaria. Of course, it's an accessible and cheap technology and uh, everything happens quickly. There is a huge interest by the business sector, but also by individual people right now. But all of this is happening because the sun is Anyway, I think this is, uh, in my opinion, uh, the reason for the strategy and motivation to lobby for NPP technologies, because at the end of the day, we always uh, can say uh, last year we had two gigawatts of new photovoltaics, and at the end of the day, we need to balance them out with a base capacity, and we need that base capacity right now. And here it's important to say, uh, I agree with everything the professor said, and I have been uh, following this technology for a long time. Uh, this technology is important for uh, helping the citizens in the energy transition and uh, in the attraction of private and uh, private investment in uh, water hydroelectric power plants. But I don't think there is a conflict between solar or photovoltaics and uh, nuclear power. Not at all. Um, on the contrary, it's clearly apparent that no opportunity is being given uh, as uh, an existing framework for private investment in other hydroelectric technologies uh, or renewable technologies that could uh, balance photovoltaics and en enable us to transition to a different grid management model that we are seeing not just in literature but in practice too that doesn't only depend on uh, base uh, capacity because uh, base capacity is a large investment that uh, doesn't uh, permit flexibility but uh, what is going to be available over time and to allow us to be competitive on the man and energy markets is flexibility the more flexible we can be both in terms of uh, supply and demand the more competitive we are going to be, and this is uh, what's going to pay with dividends at the energy on the energy markets in the future. So, it's uh, good to uh, pay attention to that. And I once again think there is no conflict. On the contrary, this is an intentional policy for a lot of photovoltaics without much to balance them. Thank you. Now. Uh, when I heard base capacity, I thought uh, this was where you were going to finish, but I agree that this base capacity is a bit of a mantra that's being repeated by the nuclear power sector, but uh, this base capacity is something that should be cheap, and there is no cheap nuclear power plant. You know, we're talking about like 50 billion lefts here and so on. Uh, uh, I Yes, yes, it's important for the energy balance, indeed. Yes, the question is, we want a more varied energy mix, of course. We don't want it to only contain photovoltaics, but Professor Vasilov is an expert in photovoltaics, so uh, this is why. Uh, just let me say something about the base capacity. This is a key topic everyone is talking about base uh, capacity but this term uh, it has changed a lot and the definition of uh, base capacity 
uh, has morphed into something completely new. And let me tell you what it looks like nowadays. The base capacity of a photovoltaic park can be the um, act as, as base capacity in summer months. And in winter, uh, maybe for eight months, it can act as base capacity, but that's about it. We have these new generation inverters that are 220 kilowatts. We also have a, a new photovoltaic plant with a good peak capacity that that's, uh, gets connected to the DC voltage of the inver inverter, and you can connect a cheap new generation battery to it with 20,000 cycles and 50 years lifetime. And uh, the cost for energy passing through this battery will be extremely low. And the inverter itself uh, has uh, AC electricity that goes to the transformer. And this set of uh, photovoltaic park battery and inverter can act as base capacity. Why? Because let's say you have a cloud over the if you with the existing PV uh, plants, they lose capacity immediately when there is less sun. But here uh, in uh, such a modern generation photovoltaic, they can predict the passage of uh, clouds and plan in advance and store energy in their battery. And uh, they can ensure constant energy load and you can regulate the uh, frequency uh, with the inverters, you can uh, regulate the voltage, you can regulate the load, the, you can uh, regulate all of the parameters so we can have inductive capacity and so on. So this is how you can get your base capacity here on site. If you have a hundred uh, photovoltaic plants, uh, plants like that with a hundred inverters, you can have the base capacity at the spot where the power is being used. And secondly, these photovoltaic parks no longer uh, are uh, threatening to the land. On the contrary, they're agricultural parks. So you can produce agricultural uh, output uh, and that agricultural output can be uh, five, up to five times higher than uh, typical production. Okay, we, we understand, we understand, but we do need a mix, you know. <laughs> uh, you know, I like our game with guys like uh, like you who say we need a mix, but uh, at another time. I'm glad that the professor clarified about uh, balancing, uh, because everyone who talks about balancing the system uh, means something, but they don't clarify what they mean exactly. This is why the discussion never becomes specific enough. I have two questions. The first one is maybe last year we had a uh, scientific no, uh, news that I think in England they achieved at a basic level a breakthrough and they managed to do, if I'm not mistaken, they managed to make one electron uh, break apart to protons or something, or maybe the other way around. I don't remember the specifics, but do you know about it? Do you know how far they have progressed? And my second question is, I am having an argument with some colleagues about uh, if the personal use uh, photovoltaic panels and energy cooperative panels are become more widespread, something that is basically prohibited by law in Bulgaria right now, and if uh someone if this happens wouldn't it be better in order to reduce our costs even more wouldn't it be better for us to start working with domestic uh dc appliances and uh, just uh, forego the need for converters thanks to mr kovacic for the interesting questions this technology with one photon we are uh hitting two electrons and this is what causes higher effectiveness this technology is being developed the cell point quantum points uh, is are part of that technology and it allows to increase the uh, potential of silicon panels with this technology we can reach up to 36 40 percent uh, capacity but we have another new interesting technology 
um, uh, that has an 80% effectiveness. And now in that technology, a lot of work is being put into it. Imagine an 80% effectiveness with the, compared to the current 24% effectiveness. What does it mean? It means a small panel could power an entire home. So this is only your first question. Now the other question was about using direct currents directly. Yes. So if currently residential buildings are using alternating current and uh, industrial buildings are using alternating current, but uh, for most users, uh, most of their appliances can work with uh, direct current, like a boiler, an oven, a TV, all of them uh, can work with DC. So most appliances can use that. So this transformation from from to DC in energy production and then the other way around for domestic households, all of these transformations of our electricity are causing a lot of extra costs. And uh, we have a trend like that in, in Germany. You know, Germans are uh, quite innovative uh, where uh, someone uh, transforms their house to work only with DC and profit out of that. Indeed, this is logical. Uh, so yes, there is a lot of good sense in this. Okay, we have a question from Zoom to you. The question is by Mr. Ruslan Christov. In view of what the professor said, aren't we risking giving, uh, handing our country's energy security to the Chinese Communist Party? This is the question. The question is if you're a Chinese agent, <laughs> briefly. As a result of what you're saying, aren't we risking to hand over our uh, country's national security to the Chinese uh, Communist Party? This is quote the question. Thank you. The question is very interesting. Now, I am looking at the genesis of these processes because I have witnessed everything that happened and how people who uh, had uh, the Chinese, they had zero technology at the time when Germany was creating 60% of the world uh, global panel production and Germany literally just gave it away for free. There was no political foresight there. So I agree with the uh, thesis that Europe needs to create this industry with a supply chain, uh, with uh, photovoltaic metal metallurgy and production of these uh, photovoltaic silicon wafers. That, uh, that's a very energy intensive production. And the processing of the panel, panels and everything, we do need to create this industry, absolutely. And this, uh, of course, we are uh, members of the World uh, Trade Organization and we cannot violate their uh, laws uh, about state aid. But this can happen, we can find a way. I absolutely support this. In Bulgaria, we had uh, attempts to work for this. But currently, the only thing we are doing is metal structures, but at least we're doing this right. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we are. We can rest assured that uh, we are safe from the CCP. Now let me ask Associate Professor Zinoviev, and he will have a presentation that is going to be fully in unison with our vision uh, for energy policy. We will be talking about energy cooperatives. Thank you for the attention, and I apologize once again. I have to go for unforeseen reasons. Thanks to Mr. Tudorov and my colleagues from Zazemiata or for Earth. It's always a pleasure to be present at such discussions and to hear all of these professional opinions. There is a lot to be said on the previous topics as well, but I will uh, emphasize on, on my report. Once again, then we can talk a lot uh, within the context of the previous topics. Once upon a time, I was studying about sustainability and transition in energy systems, and there uh, the main question is very clear, which is about maintaining uh, everything clean. So this is why the question is not about the 
effectiveness of a photovoltaic panel, but it's about whether a renewable uh, energy source can be dispatched or not. And this is the main issue we're currently facing. It's going to be the future problem as well. If we don't uh, work, if we don't create very serious measures for a redesign of the entire uh, energy system, then that includes both the low, medium, and high voltage uh, electric grids. And so if we are talking about what is going to happen in the future, we all know the four Ds, decarbonization, uh, which is the main reason we're thinking about an energy transformation, about the concept of replacing carbon intensive uh, sources with uh, carbon neutral generation on one hand, and on the other hand, replacing uh, uh, Car getting carbon neutral consumers. This is uh, very important and it needs to be paid attention to. Yes, uh, the first, uh, first we have decarbonization and second we have decentralization and within this context, I think the vision of the European uh, Union is also extremely uh, logical and reasonable. And it is to not focus on large centralized uh, power production capacities, but instead to have a distributed network over a large geographical territory of renewable uh, power generation. And uh, the points of generation of electricity uh, ideally need to be as close as possible to the points of consumption of electricity. Of course, we also have digitalization within the context of how to make uh, generators and the electric grid as a whole more flexible, more aligned with the needs of the new generation of consumers and to allow uh, uh, them to be both consumers but also generators of energy. And this uh, leads us to the fourth D, which is democratization energy democratization, dear colleagues, is extremely complicated. And this is why energy cooperatives, or and uh, they are not a universal solution, of course, but they're a good approach towards having a working model, a working model in the mid and long term uh, plan. Of course, here I could go uh, further back to discuss what was mentioned here before. If things were as simple as the professor before me uh, was saying, uh, we would all be swimming in honey and milk. But the reality is more complicated than that. If we don't have standards, every one of us will choose the cheapest possible inverter. If this inverter can uh, jeopardize the grid of all neighbors, people don't care about it. This is just how the reality works. Because we can observe this happening in real life. The moment, however, that you are in an energy cooperative and the idea is to share this resource, not just in terms of quantity, but also quality. This is why I'm saying the main point is to keep it clean. Yes, batteries are also a great uh, way to keep it clean. I have um, realized uh, implemented projects like that because uh, in addition to science and research, uh, the center I'm uh, leading also I have many years of experience uh, from the energy sector, over 15 years of experience there. I have implemented and uh, completed lots of projects, including photovoltaics. And I can tell you that there is an incredible behavior of the grid. The moment you create a microgrid and it gets uh, charged with a battery facility, the 
clarity really uh, just becomes fantastic. You can barely see any uh, deviation. And there's another point here. Uh, when, uh, now, when we're talking about battery life, in order to have such a high cycle of charging and discharging, this means you have no more than 50 to 60% of the capacity of the power. So you will never be doing 100% charge and 100% discharge of the battery. So I'm just mentioning this within a technical context, uh, if you want to uh, operate a facility in the long term. Once again, anything can happen, but we need to have a clear idea of how it will happen and what are the technical and economic aspects of everything. You can see some of the uh, key points I've tried to synthesize to explain why it's important, why it makes sense, and why energy cooperatives have potential here, uh, or energy communities. Uh, here, there lies the key towards energy democratization. The idea of an energy cooperative or energy community is uh, yesterday, I, I discussed this with a colleague from the Bulgarian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and I had an interesting metaphor uh, come to mind. I said, it's like the National Health Insurance Fund. Everyone invests in the energy community, and um, it's being used by everyone who needs it. But the question is about the economic benefit, and so the economic benefit is very clear. If we all create an energy community or cooperative based on, let's say, photovoltaic uh, panels on the rooftops or another technology, let's not go into detail about the specifics. Um, let's focus on the generation because the topic of energy consumers is uh, complicated and vast and it also uh, deserves a special analysis of its own. But... Anyway, the moment that within our energy cooperative we are uh, covering about 40 to 50% of the energy needs, this means, uh, mean, means not only that 40% would be only the result of the capital expenditure, it means that 40% of the electricity we are uh, saving up on all concurrent costs like uh, grid electricity, medium, high and low voltage and uh, uh, fees and taxes for each megawatt hour passing through this infrastructure. Also the additional costs, balancing, combining. Uh, um, now with the new changes, it's going to be a very interesting topic, but that's not the topic. Uh, also the role of aggregators. So... At the end of the day, we are all going to invest, let's say 100 people invest uh, 1,000 lefts in a microgrid like that and to create an energy cooperative. And uh, some individuals will be using free electricity, for example, within the limits of one left per year and so others will be using it within a framework of five lives per year but the moment we collect our summary result as a community as a sum of consumers if last year we had we were paying a total of 1000 lives for electricity this year we will be paying 600 uh, 600 and here's the key problem in my opinion to the bulgarians our national mentality the moment an idea like that is realized, who's going to profit more from it? And why, for example, my neighbor is using more free electricity than me, maybe because he works from home during the day when a solar power is um, best. Of course, we also have the other topics about the role of uh, storage facilities and the batteries. Um, but it's all a question of capex and opex. Uh, it's not such a simple calculation. It's not so simple to just talk about how easy it is to require panels and batteries. No one currently can tell you what will be the decommissioning cost for a photovoltaic plant. 
whether it's 30 kilo, kilowatts or 100 meg, uh, kilowatts or one megawatt uh, 30 years down the road. Personally, I cannot predict this. And I think I have uh, excellent expertise in the area of electrification, as my colleagues know, but that's about it. So this is the picture <clears throat> with a slight uh, note here that I think the only project for, ener for an energy community in Bulgaria that exists is not entirely an energy community or cooperative within the meaning of the model provided by the European Commission. Within this context, uh, also I would like to say that at the beginning of June uh, this year, uh, we are organizing a science conference so that will have a slightly different topic. It will be focused on energy cooperatives and we will be sharing the experience of colleagues from Italy, from the USA, from Japan. And these are the universities that we are working with and have been working with very well for years. The Kyoto University, Polytechnicum, uh, Polytechnical University and others from Sweden and Austria and other countries, of course, other scientific research uh, institutes. This is the unfortunate reality uh, that you can see on the slide. It's uh, now from, uh, I know you expected us to have more optimism in the afternoon session of the panel, but the only optimistic thing to say is that uh, currently in Bulgaria, we are at such a low level that anything we do will uh, be incredible growth in the years to come. From the end of last year in Bulgaria, we have the legislative changes that enable, enable us to talk about uh, creating energy cooperatives. And here, once again, the devil is in the details. For over six months now, uh, after these legislative changes, we still don't have a regulation that can allow us to uh, make energy cooperatives happen. And of course, not least, we have to mention a few other changes that happened into the legislation, which is the smallest gen generators, which is the photovoltaic plants, up to 30 kilowatt peaks uh, were uh, brought out of the regulated market and uh, into the free market. And this is uh, completely, contra completely contrary to what the European Commission wants to do. So realistically, the capital expenditure per kilowatt peak of uh, energy capacity for these small generators is much higher than the one for uh, large photovoltaics that are in the megawatt range. So, so the logic for creating these legislative requirements and this, these types of producers to remain on the market until 2035, the logic was very clear. And this is the model that the European Commission wants to encourage. Numerous small and micro uh, producers distributed over a long, over a large geographical area. Uh, and instead, we are seeing the opposite happen, which is more and more large concentrated photovoltaic plants are appearing. And within the tens of uh, hundreds of megawatt peak uh, ranges. So this is uh, pretty much it. I know from experience that the best lecture is the brief lecture. So I remain available for questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you so much to Associate Professor Zinoviev. This is a rare occurrence for a university lecturer to give a brief lecture. <laughs> Who is, who's first? And Georgi. Okay. You mentioned the regulation about energy cooperatives, and I was wondering what's that uh, regulation, but 
before that, I wanted to ask you something else about other regulations. Regulation 14 of the Council of Ministers from 2005, which is about the technical requirements for production and distribution and storage of electrical energy. It's 19 years old. It hasn't been updated. Regulation number 15 about thermal thermal power for the same things. It was updated once in 2016. And these two regulations <clears throat> uh, are the documents and standards that are super important and need to be applied in terms of the processes uh, in the final stage of implementation, security, uh, and all of that. And I was going to ask you, in these two regulations, is there a space, a place for energy cooperatives there? And then you mentioned another regulation, which uh, confused me a little bit. Can you clarify? Because there's a third regulation which up, uh, implements the changes related to the energy characteristics of buildings directive within the context of um, internal cables, energy efficiency, uh, and so on and so forth. I think it's uh, uh, regulation 2023. It's a, uh, a bit ahead of European legislation, but the other regulations are way behind. So between those two extremes, I'm, important, I'm interested to hear uh, what regulation specifically you were talking about. Uh, apologies for the complicated question. You covered an exotic range of topics. What's relevant specifically to the regulation I was talking about is about the uh, implementation of this act and the way energy cooperatives are being to be structured. It's about the new regulation and it needs to cover the... Okay, look, right now we have license holders within the... Uh, electricity distribution companies. Uh, each company has its own territory. Right now, for over a year, we've had the change which affects closed distribution networks. If I'm not mistaken, we have the first one already in an industrial area in uh, the Western electrical distribution region. And in the same way, processes were very well structured uh, before based on the legislation. The same thing should happen here, and this type of approach should be covered with a lot of specifics because, once again, electrical energy as a field is a very clear sector. We are talking about critical infrastructure, and we need to really have a lot of specifics and details there. Unfortunately, let me say again, I'm not the correct uh, person to answer all questions because I'm not related to the com commissions in the National Assembly or I'm not an expert on other topics. I can only share my opinion about a similar type of uh, legislation in other countries, in Europe, the USA and Japan, but I do not think my expertise is relevant and uh, can help us predict processes in the legislation in Bulgaria. I was very pleasantly surprised myself by the fact that the Bulgarian parliament uh, adopted such a resolution to change the legislation uh, in a way which would enable the creation of energy cooperatives. And I was unpleasantly surprised by the decision <clears throat> to bring uh, the smallest uh, producers of energy uh, to the free market. But I don't want to comment about the economic benefit from these uh, generators uh, being brought to the free market. And I think here uh, the colleagues who are present and uh, following and are following our stream, I think they're uh, competent enough to make these uh, to have their own conclusions. Gennady Kondarev with a personal statement. Just something about the last thing you uh, asked us about, about uh, this uh, change with the small energy producers and the creation of more aggregators. This is something we need to allow uh, uh, the aggregators happen. I would like to say that we have more than one energy community in Bulgaria. This is not a matter for pride because energy communities have happened over the years and they unfortunately didn't... Uh, it didn't get gain traction uh, as far back as in 2001, the first energy 
cooperative I knew about was uh, an energy community uh, uh, sponsored by Brunata. It was created in uh, the Vasilevsky neighborhood. And there for uh, a residential building installed large industrial collectors for heating of, for water heating. So we're talking about uh, thermal energy here, not about electricity. Yes, it was about thermal energy, but I think it's a classical energy cooperative. Now Brunata uh, gave up on the project because they couldn't collect the funds for it. And a couple of years later, the people themselves restarted it and with their own technical expertise managed to, I think it's still ongoing, this system. Excellent example, but later on. Yes, sorry, but it is an energy community. No, I'm, uh, look, I'm not uh, being sarcastic. I'm just sharing my main concern, uh, which is uh, how can we overcome uh, the uh, national mentality uh, in our attempt to gain from an approach or from an investment instead of thinking how much uh, each of us is going to gain. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's, uh, by the way, the system would be rusting on the roof, which happens a lot with other types of systems. Similar, yes. Four buildings were uh, done with a program called uh, Staccato uh, for uh, hot water uh, heating. But it was basically 50% uh, of the cost saving for, uh, it's around. Uh, proximity to the neighborhood, capital neighborhood. Uh, um, they have a basically facility manager who is very, um, he's quite okay. Uh, he's technically sudden, so they have some money saved from the building of this uh, EPC building and they operate uh, really well. They get the uh, revenue, but yeah, but there's a moment in time where you have the sale of uh, electricity, you have uh, commercial activity. And the idea of the energy community, uh, the energy cooperative, is to basically have the cogeneration be um, done within this uh, within this community. So within the models that I've started uh, in, uh, um, I mean, I've started them model in, with the colleagues in Italy is that uh, the free uh, uh, electric power, they don't keep it, they donate it for the purposes of uh, uh, households and schools and so on. But this, um, I think you see that I have uh, very briefly uh, touched upon this topic. Um, instead of uh, giving uh, funds for uh, you know heating and, and, and wood for for heating and so on. Then the state can do the right thing and be more uh, responsible with with this approach. I'm sorry for interrupting you, but the idea is that we're not a commercial company. We all build a photovoltaic power plant and sell the energy generated, and with the funds, for example, we repair or meet other costs. That's the idea. Not the idea. The idea is that, to the maximum degree possible, this uh, electric power will be utilized for the purposes of the energy community. Yeah, according to the definition, definition, this is the perfect way. But there was a tariff, and this was the way. All other features uh, have uh, to do with being an energy community. And so, the biggest uh, failure uh, with us is that we cannot make the citizens be. Um, how should I put it, uh, engage stakeholders in this transition, which is something, something, for example, that used to happen a lot in Poland, for example. In uh, 12 gigawatt peaks, uh, peak uh, developed uh, uh, generation capacity, they are situated on rooftops with a ground and with a program which used to function from 2019 to last year. And how they're going to continue, we will find out with time, I'm guessing. So let me proceed, um, uh, taking the cue from uh, Georgi and uh, from Gennady. Um, well, I am not surprised with what happened uh, with the changes in the uh, the law of renewable sources. 
on the one hand, they open the door slightly for uh, energy communities. On the other hand, they hit the small ones. Uh, in some of the letters that I read and I saw the Eastern uh, energy regulator, uh, to the end consumers, it's, I mean, just even from the contractual uh, deals and so on, this is just a very bad uh, story. But uh, because we participated together with the colleagues from Greenpeace, VDF, and so on, uh, writing these uh, draft texts that were not, um, they were not perfect, but they couldn't pass as laws. They were more uh, clarifying or giving uh, opportunities. Uh, they were not accepted, though. Um, um, I am interested in whether someone in Bulgaria has studied and uh, ensured how this transition will happen under the existing condition, which basically means a large producer's transformation. We're closing down. Um, um, I mean, for 40,000 megawatts, 100 megawatts in the sea, uh, gas nonstop, uh, you know, pedal to the metal. But, you know, <laughs> it's a very apocalyptic picture that you're uh, drawing. Yeah, how to do it, how to make things so that the small producers and the energy communities would, um, I mean, uh, if the steps are to be real, that there would not be new commercial companies, but they would be the closest to the definition of Western Europe. Uh, and on the other hand, enabling them to not be limited uh, in the mix that they're going to do, because they, in Bulgaria still we cannot uh, install a wind uh, deck in urbanized um, or zoned areas, which are quite advanced already. and. Um, uh, maybe we can create a uh, you know community which uh, shares energy to the last degree. So the people's mentality we're not going to sell, and uh, again, it's maybe a blocking factor. But I'm not asking about this factor in particular this time. The, from the point of view of the Bulgarian energy electric energy system, how do we get to point B, uh, where we have uh, well working uh, energy communities? Uh, uh, without uh, thinking about the market uh, regulatory conditions. Thank you once again. This is a great uh, question in practice. Uh, it gives us a lot of uh, examples, good examples to follow. And uh, there are countries in the Western and Central Europe, we need to know what the um, 10 point is. Well, the operators of the distributive, uh, distributive uh, networks are usually municipal. And so the logic of the energy um, cooperative, if the municipality is part of the energy cooperative with the, some uh, utility consumers, uh, along with all of the adjacent uh, social uh, infrastructure, this is not uh, uh, schools and kindergartens. It could be uh, old, old people people's retirement homes or, or some other structures that are offering uh, social services uh, for the uh, residents of the community. These are a little bit different. Our uh, electric uh, power distribution companies don't have uh, municipal property. They no longer have a state uh, uh, property after the sale of the minority share of the uh, three ERP. So the state is no longer there as well. So the standpoint here is this. Um, of course, uh, it's a very natural question in terms of uh, the degree to which a microgrid would be able to operate as an O grid. So it would be an independent, um, fully independent grid. And uh, we're going here in the direction of uh, the legislation because how are you going to get a uh, uh, construction permit if you don't have a preliminary agreement, connection agreement? And uh, Act uh, Form 16, if it's not uh, final. Um, but so I'm saying uh, there are many things which uh, need to be considered and uh, expertise uh, sharing uh, foreign experience, uh, not based on copy paste, but adapting to the specific needs of the Bulgarian consumers, the specifics of uh, the architecture of uh, the Bulgarian and uh, 
uh, distribution and uh, transmission uh, grid um, are meaningful to uh, having the fine tuning of our unique model so that we can make it as economically feasible as possible when we're talking about energy communities. Thank you, Associate Professor Inovia. Um, the only thing that I can suggest is that uh, when we wait for the elections in June and uh, have the um, government, uh, I mean, we should uh, make a second uh, installment of this discussion. Um, and then with the new government, which would be very energetic uh, for Christmas, uh, they are going to promise us uh, that they are going to change everything in terms of the energy cooperative, such as, uh, as uh, Professor Zinoviev is suggesting. And um, outside of my, uh, you know, laughing through my tears, uh, and, uh, this is uh, what the reality is uh, with the a series of uh, selections and um, refusal of uh, taking responsibility or taking charge of a committee, and then the Minister of American um, uh, Embassy, and I don't know who else I'm missing, uh, but um, all of them are uh, quite uh, perplexed at the moment and they're waiting for the basically the um, uh, election campaign because the things that we were discussing here the whole day. These are the real questions that we need to ask. Uh, these are the real things that we need to solve. But uh, we are in a situation like that. So are there any more questions? Or if not, then yeah, we did great. Now I have a question to you, addressed to you personally. These things in the good practice of someone we both know, Mr. Nekov, uh, who we both know as a moderator, are you going to do them like a message, key takeaway message from the people who didn't join us? Because in the morning, uh, I mean, in the afternoon, we can talk about solutions. We can be in agreement or not in agreement. I think in the morning part in particular about the nuclear power plant, regardless of who uh, was in a stage of the political devolution would uh, allow people to gain the information and to receive it uh, in a uniform way. So, because when the elections come, they would be not be able to say, well, we didn't know. I mean, the, I stand behind the main recommendations that were done in the morning. And uh, furthermore, there is a, you know, a recording of the whole session. I'm going to send the recording to the institution. We're going to try to take out as a the things as a text uh, from this presentation to send them to all the speakers and have them uh, edit their notes. Uh, so we're not going to uh, let the politicians just uh, stand like this and promise uh, coal in the hydrogen valley in Stara Zagora and uh, nuclear power until the end of the world. So they are all going to be engaged, including, by the way, the European Commission, which was also invited um, to this event to listen in. But they will get the recording anyway. And so no one will be able to say that they didn't hear this. Nobody would be able to say that they were not notified. And so, okay, if we are we ready? Yeah, just uh, final words to wrap up. Uh, perhaps uh, let me just uh, say that uh, for uh, two or three months, I've been the uh, proud member of the energy um, uh, Cooperative in Gabrovo. I'm very proud. That's the only one that counts in the statistics. I didn't mention it explicitly, but because you are talking about it, that's the one. Yeah, indeed. Uh, I hope that uh, good examples in this uh, field would uh, increase uh, more and more, where the municipality and some other uh, structures in Gabrovo and in the region could use the uh, uh, energy really. And um, I just also wanted to thank uh, both to the speakers uh, and the people in attendance uh, who, uh, we, who are uh, viewing this event on Zoom. I would like to also use the opportunity to invite you to our events that will be organized in the future on the April the 25th. Uh, we are going to have a common uh, event with the colleagues from City in, in effect uh, uh, dedicated to the national 
energy integrated plan and climate. And in order by June the 30th, uh, member states need to deliver the final versions to the European Commission of the updated plans. Uh, and uh, yet uh, there is a lot of work to be done on the Bulgarian version of this plan. But in April the 25th, in the morning, we would like to present uh, our opinions and recommendations on the draft of the plan, which was already published by the end of the month of February. So really, we need to have a better version. And um, as um, expert, uh, you know, as many expert opinions uh, would be integrated in this version. And once again, I would like to thank you all for your atten attendance and uh, until we meet again.